Thank you for bringing us all together and even more for organizing this on Earth Day. What a brilliant, remarkable and beautiful choice for dialogue on food finance, which can become very technical very soon, especially with all the distinguished experts we have participating. So I hope you bring an Earth-centered mindset for today. My contribution to that is that I brought a plant into my working space, but I also decided to step outside this morning and briefly but firmly put my hands on our earth. My palms felt damp from the light drizzle that had fallen overnight. I smelt the revigorating scent of the fresh grass, given an energizing sensation together with the warm, soothing spring sunlight that stroked my back while I had my eyes closed and tried to connect with our earth. You might have participated in previous dialogues or perhaps it is your first, but I can guarantee you that this one is very special. These dialogues are of course hosted under the umbrella of the UN Food Systems Summit, a very unique and timely summit, bringing together multi-stakeholder actors to collaborate on game-changing solutions, transforming our food systems to be more healthy, sustainable and equitable. The most promising game-changing initiatives will be presented at the pre-summit in July. And also the dialogue of today will be feeding into the preparations and the agenda of the pre-summit, kick-starting action and building momentum towards the summit in September. So with all the preparation that has gone into the summit so far, with hundreds of dialogues like the one we are having today, we roughly know what needs to be done. There are also several independent monitoring mechanisms, like the benchmarks from the organization that I work for, the World Benchmarking Alliance, that measure whether commitments and targets are backed by action and performance. The big accelerator that enables ambitions to be translated into impact are of course financial resources. And that, it was, that is what makes today's dialogue so special. That and the fact that it is hosted on Earth Day, which this year has the theme, Restore Our Earth. Earth Day was actually first proposed by peace activist, John McConnell in 1969, with a purpose to honor the earth and the concept of peace. It struck me that originally Earth Day was so closely linked to peace. And after more than a year of living in some form of confinement with anxiety and maybe even personal loss, I'm sure we have all come to rediscover nature. The importance of protecting nature in its wildest, luscious form. The importance of nature to our mental health and inner peace as well as the importance of nature to our collective well-being and peaceful, prosperous coexistence as a society. As Franklin Roosevelt said, a nation that destroys its soils destroys itself. And that brings me to the content. Today's session is actually the first and only food systems dialogue focusing on blended finance. To dive into this on Earth Day really highlights that this discussion is not only relevant for boardrooms, but relevant to each citizen. That public and private efforts can come together, not merely because of the common good, but to transform food economies to be inclusive, resilient, and nourishing. Having sustainability at the core of food strategies goes beyond a moral obligation. It has become an existential necessity. And that is why I'm thrilled to introduce you to the first keynote speaker of today, Mr. Wiebe Dreyer, Chairman of the Executive Board at Rabobank. He's one of the most outspoken and ambitious financial leaders of our time, guiding Rabobank to live up to its ambition of growing a better world together. Wiebe, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you for, uh, for that uh... Uh, uh, vigorous opening and uh, and um, an introduction of myself. Please don't take all those words seriously. But uh, but I do care about the subject that is uh, today on the agenda, and I think um, there couldn't be a better subject on this Earth Day than to figure out how the transition that we all now see as eminent and urgent uh, needs to be shaped. And one of the key ingredients of that transition is the enablement of key players in the food supply chain to make investments needed in line with the transition that was so eloquently described by Victoria. 
And um, there are many hurdles today on the way. And the funny part is this, that on the one hand, many of these investments are, as you as a banker would say, and frankly, I'm a mechanical engineer, I lead a bank, but, uh, but in that sense, I'm a learned banker. But many of the investments that we're talking about are in the money. They make sense. They make sense from a only pure financial point of view, but they make even more sense from a fully loaded um, sustainable development goal sense. If we were to price the benefits of these investments at full value, then these, these, all these investments would be fully in the money. On the other hand of the chain, there is also sufficient money. There is actually an abundance of capital available for some form of investments. It's just that the two ends don't connect. And blended finance is the subject that needs to be explored. There are a couple of factors that are in this equation. One is the many of the investments at this point in time are risky in nature, and therefore not all the investment agents or players have an appetite that uh, would uh, entice them to step in. Combining the appetite and the willingness and the risk profile, again, the banker speak, of many of the uh, different stakeholders, be it governments, be it institutional investors, bankers, insurance companies, uh, pension funds, combining the risk appetite, connecting them together, if you could use a metaphor, would open up some of these investments. Regulatory um, uh, factors in play to create a stable outlook for these investments is an important factor. And simple access of many of the smaller players in the food supply chain, like smallholder farmers, to capital, to finance, is an, an, a lever. I would very much like that today would be a place where, with this on the agenda, that a couple of breakthroughs are explored in terms of how to build a, an integrated approach to this finance question that will enable both small holder farmers, medium-sized players, to make the requirement investments. I am convinced that in the client base that Rabo, for example, serves as one of the leading banks in the world, in the world of food, that the need and the conviction is there in the food supply chain. We need to find a way of transitioning the food supply and the production of food in the world to a stable footing, a sustainable footing that, that um, addresses all the, the costs to the planet in biodiversity loss. We need to find a way of create biodiversity gain in CO2 Absorption, the planet will be better off if we do it in a proper fashion rather than um, that it expels CO2, but also in terms of the social well-being of the players involved. Many of these factors can be achieved and it is urgently needed towards feeding the world in a sustainable, healthy way in 2050, starting already in 2030. If we explore these opportunities, if we are able to connect the different needs of investment players, I'm convinced this is possible. But we need an open dialogue where people sit at, around the same table and try to design it in a way that can start to work. Our experience is, and we are one of the major investors in the sustainable energy production in the world. Offshore wind is one example. Um, solar energy is one of those examples. Each of those large scale investment waves were triggered by a small stream, a small current, where innovative thinking took place, engineering thinking took place in terms of how can we map the the needs of the invest, investing entity, the entrepreneur, with the possibilities of the finance side, both in terms of risk in, um, in a return, but also in duration, length of the investment cycle. And only if you put those three factors together at the design table, at the table, and today it could be the start, will this trickle, this small stream start to flow that forms the pathway for huge investments that are needed to make the transition. Thank you so much for permitting me to be one of the uh, starting uh, speakers on that journey. I love this engineering question as an engineer, but I do think that's actually needed with aligned interest at the table and an open mind towards new solutions and not sticking to each individual's needs in that discussion and that exploration. I wish you all a <laughs> great success with that exploration and I look forward to being part of finding the pathway, the trickle that becomes a stream that becomes a river. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Riva. And thank you for really so clearly stating that sustainable investment makes economic sense and also the importance of these different, different people coming together to work on the solutions. What we're also trying to achieve in the dialogues today with such a diverse uh, background of people joining. Thank you. Our next keynote speaker of today is Dr. Suzanne Gardner, Director of the Ecosystems Division at UNEP. She has over two decades of experience in science and environmental policy 
with exceptional knowledge on oceans and nature-based solutions, just to name a few. But she will speak on how to scale up investments in food systems transformation. Suzanne, we look very much forward to hearing your thoughts. Over to you. Well, thank you, Victoria. Happy Earth Day. I see also that you're celebrating by wearing green. Uh, so we have that in common, but you've inspired me uh, after this dialogue to go outside and put my feet in the soil. So thank you for starting with, with that uh, sentiment. Um, you know, as we heard very clearly from Weba, the we know that we need to change the way that food and, and quite, you know, non-food commodities as well are produced, traded, financed, and ultimately consumed for a food system transformation. We also need to acknowledge that food systems are the biggest driver of biodiversity loss, land use changes, and deforestation today, and a major source, of course, of greenhouse gas emissions. We know that transformation is needed. Uh, our food systems must transition toward sustainable supply chains, towards more efficient and commercially viable production models, which can lift small holders out of hunger and poverty, and at the same time ensure that we remain within our planetary boundaries and have healthier and more biodiverse diets. And this food system dialogue, which I love, they're wonderful opportunities to exchange viewpoints to better understand different perspectives and really galvanize collective action leading to the UN Food System Summit. What I'd like to put forward today is really a call to action to public and private finance to commit to concrete food systems transformational targets. We need nature and climate targets systemically integrated in loans, bonds, public and private equity, if there are to move to the necessary scale. Ahead of the 2021 Food System Summit, we can work together to address the obstacles and the barriers that currently challenge this fundamental transformation. But now is the time to be bold and to raise ambition. Together with financial institutions, UNEP's been working across every part of the value chain to support some of these, uh, these challenges. Um, overcoming these challenges, not only with innovative blended financial solutions such as the Agri-3 Fund, amongst many others, but also through networks and expertise. We at UNEP are ready to work with all of you to build sector knowledge among financial actors to improve risk assessment and pricing of sustainable agricultural investments and scale up de-risking solutions such as blended finance, uh, and to move towards standardization in metrics and finding the right incentives for farmers from small to medium to the large agricultural businesses. We can demonstrate sustainable value chains are economically viable and scale up models that have proven to work. And this is really valuable and very much needed. Today, we'll hear about a variety of brilliant solutions and innovations that are needed to scale these up and to do it quickly. We need to address the remaining obstacles that hinder financial institutions from financing sustainable models at scale so that producers can quickly pivot to more sustainable practices. We do know this is possible. Uh, and now's the time to really galvanize champions among financial institutions that will commit to ambitious targets and show that financing more sustainable food systems is possible and is profitable. A food systems transformation is achievable and it's inevitable in order to secure our future on this planet. And it's not overstating it. I say inevitable because I truly believe that we can and we must all play a role. This is about getting everyone riding the wave uh, that no longer leaves anyone behind from smallholder farmers to financial institutions. This is something that no one government institution or organization can do alone. We need all hands on deck, innovating, leaping over the hurdles and working together. And it's time to identify those, those right partners who are ready to make the commitments for this to happen. So I'm really de delighted that this dialogue is happening today. Now is the time and we know we have no time to waste. 
So thank you. Thank you very much, Suzanne. Thank you. And thank you for reminding us indeed that these big challenges ahead, uh, we can face them, they're inevitable, but we can do it together. And I really particularly like your concrete call to action that sustainability linked loans should become mainstream. They should be a niche, but that, that should be just a regular norm, really very inspiring. And also the, the call to scale it up, I think across all the dialogues today, that will be a very big question. How can we scale up these efforts? Thank you very much. Our third keynote speaker of today is Ms. Kitty van der Heide, Deputy Minister of Foreign Trade and Development Corporation at the Dutch Ministry of Foreign Affairs. She's one of the most passionate advocates I know for sustainable development and will speak about policy directions in the lead up to COP26 and the UN Food Systems Summit. Unfortunately, Kitty can't be here with us live, but she has recorded a message we will share with you now. Ladies and gentlemen, Today, on Earth Day, I urge all of us to speed up our action to respect, restore and revive the ecosystems on our planet. We are collectively undermining the very foundation upon which all life on this planet depends, and that is unacceptable. We need to take more decisive action and we need to accelerate that action, each of us individually and all of us together to preserve the Earth and, in so doing, to preserve our civilization and the survival of our species and that of others. Obviously, the way we organize our food systems is critical, and we have a choice here. Put our planet at risk, and so too our lives and our livelihoods. Or restore and protect our ecosystems and thrive as humanity. There are sad facts out there that one in nine people, that's 820 million people worldwide, are hungry or undernourished that anthropogenic factors are driving up up to 150 to 200 species into extinction every single day. And this past decade has been the hottest decade in human history. Our food systems play a key role in creating those problems, but they also suffer the negative effects of these man-made crises. The depletion of our natural capital in particular threatens to undo the progress that we've made in our food systems in recent decades. I believe we can restore this balance through three lines of action. Increasing consciousness, incentivizing solutions and visualizing the future. And the way we organize finance is a common thread in all three of these. First, increasing consciousness. This is about understanding the position of our fellow humans. The most vulnerable groups, women, young people, disabled, they will suffer the most from the current pandemic and from a changing climate. It's crucial that finance reaches them, particularly. Finance needs to be inclusive, to be effective. And a good example here is the One Acre Fund, which provides loans to smallholders. That fund was recently acknowledged by the Climate Finance Lab for its innovative approach to finance for climate and agriculture. An approach that tackles two problems at the same time hunger and climate change. But increasing consciousness also means understanding and respecting the value of our natural world on which we depend. So, no more investment in fossil fuels, in deforestation and in other forms of ecosystem destruction. The private sector and governments need to work hand in hand to ensure that this becomes the new standard, to ensure that we build back better not build back backwards to a future that we simply can't afford. Second, incentivizing solutions. To restore the balance in our food systems, we must increase and redirect investments towards a sustainable food production. Now, the big hurdle is how to de-risk those investments and to make them more attractive to private sector investors. Now, we all know that agriculture, and especially in a changing climate, can be risky business both for farmers and for investors. So we need to understand that investment in climate smart agriculture, in restoring soil fertility and improving the knowledge of smallholder farmers can actually reduce risks, including financial risks. For instance, by making geodata accessible to smallholder farmers that will help them forecast local weather patterns. Another big hurdle is the lack of pipeline of investable, impactful projects. The solution here lies in technical support and capacity development, both of which again reduce risks. 
The Netherlands warm-heartedly supports civil society organizations in transforming landscape projects into investable business cases. And a good example of where many solutions come together is the Agri3 fund. This fund redirects finance and it stimulates pipeline development within the Rabobank to support forest protection and sustainable agriculture. And all in all, we should not be afraid to try and to test, to pursue success, but also to accept the possibility of failure, to bring in trusted anchor investors and to master the art of adapting to changing circumstances, just like people in developing countries already have to do every day by now. Which brings me to the third line of action. Visualizing our future. Together. In future, we will, if we rise to the challenge, we will have redirected and scaled up our finance, incentives and interventions to an extent that there is zero hunger, no more human-induced climate change and lots of biodiversity. Regulations will have helped to guide us. And these regulations will have to be based on solid evidence. Also for sustainable food systems. Science must show us the way. That is why at the Food Systems Summit in September, the Netherlands is keen to see an ambitious agreement on establishing a more authoritative science policy interface. And which brings me to my next and my final point. The summits this year are not an end point. They are but a starting point. If we do not walk the talk after these summits, if we do not follow up with tangible action, we will reach the point of no return. This is a critical year and we face a stark choice. Either we change and adapt or we stagnate and we perish. Now I know where I would want us to go and I invite all of you to join us and to help us visualize a better future. So finally, on this Earth Day, let us acknowledge again that we're in a battle to preserve our planet, our own species and all of biodiversity's richness. And if there is anything that's crucial to this, it is food and the systems that are connected to it. Nothing is as crucial to our existence, particularly for poor people, as nourishment and clean water. This is a battle we simply cannot afford to lose. And we can still win it. We must win it. The SDGs promised a life of dignity for all people everywhere. Without sustainable food systems, we will end up delivering a broken promise, a broken dream for poor and vulnerable communities, if not for all of us as mankind. In the past, we've shown that we can improve food systems. Hunger declined while the world population grew. Now it's time to really step up our efforts to reach zero hunger as populations continue to grow and ecosystems degrade faster than we have been able to restore them in the past few years. That means we have but one alternative and one choice. A sustainable food systems. Financiers play an indispensable catalyzing role as our major partner in all of this. And mind you, we are being watched. We will be held accountable for our actions by the next generation. Thank you for your attention. It's really stressing the inevitably inevitableness of these choices and of the discussions we are having today and actually also bridging the other two keynote speakers about the possibility and the profitability that we can do it and we will do it and we can do it by collaborating together. Um, and the fact that of course the summit, we are working so hard to the summit in September, which will be one day in the year, but it's really the, the mission to kickstart uh, our, our progress and hold the momentum all the way to 2030 and beyond. But I can imagine that after all these big words and speech, speeches, it might be hard to grasp where we should start today. And I'm very grateful that I can introduce you to Ms. Aditi Gupta, Associate Director of Market Acceleration and Design Funding at Convergence. As most of you know, Convergence is the global network for blended finance that generates blended finance data, intelligence, and deal flow to increase private sector investment in developing countries. And I could think of nobody better suited to break down these big aspirations into concrete steps of action and to setting the scene for our dialogue. So I'm very pleased to introduce you to Aditi and the floor is yours. 
Thanks very much, Victoria, and also to the convening organizations for having me here. It's a pleasure to be here, and I think I can speak for everyone that the keynote speeches have been uh, quite inspiring. What I want to do is take a few minutes to set the stage for the breakout rooms that are going to be following, and that is going to be the crux of the dialogue today. So we've heard the word blended finance being repeated many times by all, almost all of the speakers before me. So let's take a moment to really understand what is blended finance. Blended finance is not the end goal in itself. It, it's the means to an end. And it is essentially a structuring approach where different types of capital can sit together in, in one financial transaction, where the financial transaction as a whole achieves the desired impact. So what we're doing is strategically using catalytic capital that may not be looking for market rate returns, but maybe looking for impact first from either public sources or philanthropic sources to mobilize private sector investment that's looking for commercial rate returns towards the sustainable development goals. And in particular, it can be an important tool to attract additional capital for the food and agriculture sector. We've already heard some of this before, but there are two main barriers to investments in the sector that blended finance can help and address. The first is it can help enhance returns. So through the use of blended finance, Returns for investors can be juiced up where the economics of the deal themselves are not sufficient. The second thing you can do is mitigate risk. And risk has come up already. We've heard from WeBay, Kitty, that getting the risk return profile right is critical for getting commercial investment into the sector. And let me take a minute to dive into risk. Risk can be both real risk or perceived risk. So real, when we talk about real risk, it could be, you know, in, in, in the food and agriculture sector, it's climate risk, it's a risk of natural, uh, a natural events uh, of commodity risk, but it could also be perceived risk where you are investing in a particular segment in the first time or particular country in the first time. And addressing risk can be hugely catalytic to getting the private sector investment flowing in. And I do want to take a moment to recognize here that we are living in the middle of a pandemic, which has been a huge uh, crisis and a massive shock to the system. And especially in this moment, we often see investment shutting down, not just because of an increase in risk, but because investors don't know how to price that increase in risk. And in this moment, blended finance approaches in particular can be useful to help provide that cushion for the investors. I do want to note here that in food and agriculture in particular, de-risking is not always the only rationale to deploy blended finance. Sometimes it can also be reduced, used to reduce transaction costs. And there are different blended finance tools that can be used, like guarantees, first loss protections, offtake commitments. And I'm sure we will be diving into some of these in, in the breakout rooms. And so, um, let me move next to setting the scene for blended finance and food and agriculture in particular by comparing it to the broader market trends that we see. So at Convergence, we have a historical deals database, which is the largest database with over 600 transactions in the blended finance space. And we see in, this, in these transactions that only about 15% of the transactions um, are just under 100 are in the food and agriculture space. That is much less than other sectors. Further, we also see that the deals for the sector are smaller than those we see in, in other sectors. And if you look at deals at a larger scale, say above $200 million, there is just a handful of deals in the blended finance for food and agriculture space. So I think what we want to do in the breakout rooms today as we go in is really see how can we mobilize investment at scale, which is not only investment at scale, but also mobilizing impact on the ground at scale, because both of these need to go hand in hand to achieve the transformative potential that, that we've talked about today. And if 
the audience is curious, uh, you can learn more about some of the approaches and the analysis through a report that Convergence and SAF in the Smallholder and Agri SME Finance Investment Network has recently published on deploying blended finance in this space. But I, I would leave all of you uh, with some questions as we go into, this, in, into these breakout rooms about really seeing how do we select the blended finance approach that is fit for purpose, that is fit for the kind of investors that are, we're looking to draw in. When we think about scale, at what level are we thinking about it? Are we talking about it at project level, at portfolio level, at a more systemic market level? Are we ensuring that there's equitable access to the finance? How are all the value chain actors being engaged? And what does success really look like for us? And with that, I'm, I'm excited to move into the breakout sessions and see all the action ideas uh, that all of us come together to. Thank you very much, Aditi. Thank you for breaking it down to us a bit and making it concrete with those great questions. And, uh, and then this overarching mission that you said really to, to look at scale, to scale of investment, but also the scale of impact. Thank you. Really helps us to, to get into, to the, into this. And I'm sure that every participant here is very eager now to, to get on with it and exchange your thoughts and hear also from others. Well, we will summarize each of the takeaways from each group uh, that, that was convened today. There were 10 groups, so it's, it's, uh, it's going to be a value, a lots of knowledge and insights coming back to us. So without further ado, I'd like to um, uh, give the floor to Ivo Milder, Head of Climate Finance Unit at uh, UNEP. Ivo, over to you. Thanks, Victoria. It's it's difficult to to moderate and then also to come up with like the three main solutions. Um, I think very rich discussion. Um, what um, I took away from, although we need to have a look at the notes, is uh, is first of all is to address systemic barriers. So I mean, the problem is that we're not paying the the, the true price of food. Um, so neither the water cost or the carbon cost or uh, the deforestation cost is integrated um, when we go to the supermarket and doing that um, will unlock and, and direct public and private finance at much larger scale. So this is, I think, uh, for governments to regulate. Um, I think in that sense, the, um, the EU taxonomy that was yesterday agreed and also the new climate law will, will certainly be helpful. Um, in terms of another solution that is an open letter um, to both public and private finance, uh, stakeholders in the lead up to the Food System Summit um, to basically unite behind a ambitious vision and, and, and commitment, which I think is extremely important. Um, and then the last one is, is basically making sure that the incentives uh, reach the farmers. So at the moment, um, what we heard from Sean Baptiste from, from ProParco, for example, is that if there's no client demand, we can get commitments, we can get more blended finance. But if the demand isn't there on the corporate side or isn't there on the farmer side, then it simply won't work. So the farmer and the corporate would need to sort of see what the benefit is of um, a, a better food system that we're all discussing. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you very much, Eva. Really clear three takeaways. And I'm going to hand it over to the second group, which was facilitated by Regina Rossman, Senior Associate at Convergence. Regina, over to you. Thank you so much. So our discussion um, focused a lot around the topic of incentives. So my first two of the three takeaways will be around incentives. First, incentives within commercial and development banks because we heard that it can be a challenge to convince people in a bank to take on and see through the blended finance deal from beginning to end because it's usually outside the business as usual type of transactions and it requires more time and more effort and so this effort has to be worth it and so there's a couple of ways how incentives can help motivate staff to take those deals on. One is integrating KPIs that can make it, make it worthwhile for the staff from a personal perspective, for example, in order to be promoted. But the other thing that we discussed was that it can also be super helpful to witness another colleague successfully closing a deal and being rewarded for it and being recognized for it within the bank. And so one success story can lead to another as peers are motivated to do similar things and to also get the same recognition. So that was one 
aspect that we discussed. The other way how we addressed incentives was from the perspective of a corporate, because it would be ideal if the shareholders would also evaluate the corporates according to criteria that are more aligned with sustainability and with mobilizing more money for sustainable practices. So currently, a lot of the ways how corporates are being evaluated centers around how much of their volume of source products is third party verified or certified. But that does not always include all things that this corporate is doing. For example, if it's providing technical assistance to the investees and trying to improve practices of farming, for example, this would simply be missed in this type of evaluation. And so trying to work on the ESG evaluation criteria of um, corporates would also provide better incentives to work towards blended finance at scale for sustainable food and agriculture. So that was the second point. And then lastly, one thing that we talked about was the importance of de-risking mechanisms, such as portfolio guarantees and offtake agreements. The offtake agreements particularly being relevant if you want to secure the cash flows, which is super important. Um, and also for smallholder farmers, that is a very, very, very important aspect. So thank you to everybody. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you very much, Regina, for this eloquent summary. And over to Francesco Rampa, Senior Expert Sustainable Development and Food Systems, G20 Sherpa of the Italian Prime Minister's Office, and also for you, the, the, the kind ask of summarizing the key messages of your group in, in roughly three minutes. Thank you. Yes, thanks Francesco. so much. Thanks so much. What um, I'm not capturing, I'm sure, with Suzanne Van Tilburg will, will be in the notes. Interesting conversation about really how to make sure investable opportunities are there along the chain for all players and, and, and risk profiling, better um, uh, metrics even on, on understanding how to invest was our starting point. And I, for it, a very important one first message is don't hope uh, that uh, ultimately uh, the Food System Summit and our processes need to achieve access to, access to finance for individuals. The, the, the sector is too differentiated. Uh, uh, very difficult to reach everyone, but it's important to think uh, if you want as a whole whole of a chain approach, and really pointed at access to markets. If if you achieve access to markets, then access to finance will probably follow. So it is really business opportunities, investment opportunities we need to gather uh, attention around, and then all of the value chain players probably will trickle down to many of them. So we need to achieve this investment opportunities and, and, and showcase them so that then access to finance will improve along the rest of the value chain. Of course, inequality, um, <clears throat> given that technology is so important, for example, in thinking of a value chain, traceability uh, is very important to make investment decision, improving traceability along the chain. But these technology solutions are in place. A lot of good examples we heard in our group uh, about technology driving better investment also for smallholder farmers, but there is still an issue of digital divide. So the, in order to reduce inequality in, in this conversation, one is uh, paying attention to the digital divide and the, and the need for uh, and, uh, smallholder farmers to, to, to be supported with the digital for uh, financial markets and also a very useful tweet type of message to re reduce inequality is not only uh, blended finance, but blending all, the, all of the actors. So the issue of partnerships to make sure that everyone is on board, absolutely crucial. And there are examples around of how to do that and connect it to investment. So blended a multi-stakeholder partnership, not only blended finance. And the third key message was more about the process, process looking forward. Uh, what we, can we expect from the Food System Summit? Uh, not easy, of course, to make decision when we are so many around the, around the summit. But uh, first of all, uh, starting from possibly understanding and agreeing at the Food System Summit uh, uh, what uh, it's to do no harm with investment. So clarifying what is the stick, but connecting that conversation, what is the carrot? How can incentives be created, including from ministers of finance, regulators, to make sure that uh, uh, we repurpose agricultural subsidies, we give a different types of incentives, and we, we connect the stick and carrot approach and, and, and also all support a good initiative like the Net Zero Banking Alliance. So moving forward, the summit is just the beginning. And then we all need to listen to the finance lever of the summit and work together to combine stick and carrot.
Thank you. Thank you very much, Francesco. Great summary. And over to Ariana Giuliadori, Secretary General of the World Farmers Organization. Also to you, I like this analogy of tweets in three tweets, three key messages. Ariana, over to you. Thank you very much, Victoria. It was a great conversation. Um, many messages are echoing what Francesco just said, so I'll go very quickly through that. So the first point is that if we want to have uh, more investable opportunities and be successful in blended finance approach, we must be brave and embrace what we call the SDG 17 approach. So real partnerships, seeing all the players as partners in the value chain, overcoming kind of a more traditional supply chain approaches from farmers to consumers and including the midstream players. And to do so, we must overcome that's the second point, a huge lack of knowledge about how the value chain function and who the actors really are, in starting with who the farmers really are. So understanding the role of farmers as economic actors at whatever scale they are operating and making sure that they can get a fair value for what they do. Third point, as it was already mentioned, the need to consider together access to finance and access to markets because uh, they are deeply interrelated and uh, or making sure that we can create opportunities on the market will facilitate all tax finance. Fourth, the need to do risk, which is something that, we, that is uh, urgently felt by all the players, the risk investment in agriculture. And we know that agricultural investment is uh, typically a long term and there's a gap in yields and uh, in moving transition to more sustainable practices. And we must do what is needed to support the farmers in that transition. Finally, final, final point, uh, we must make sure that the value of the efficiency gains go down to the farmer so that they can invest in the transition as economic actors in this game. Thank you very much. Over. Fantastic, Ariana. Thank you very much. Really clear. I'm uh, next on uh, to report back Richard Newman, Senior Sustainable Finance Specialist at CCAFs. Richard, also to you, the brief takeaways, three main takeaways. Thanks, Victoria. Uh, yes, so we had an excellent discussion on how the so-called innovation ecosystem can really support efforts to scale when it comes to blended finance. So we started talking about an example of how a research organization is supporting an asset manager in designing a climate smart food system fund. And uh, as we know, blended finance is all about de-risking or revenue enhancing. But that's not necessarily just from a capital allocation or loss-taking perspective. We can also rely on the knowledge of science and innovation, right? And in the case of the fund, it's really to support the asset manager and the investee to really understand the risks related to biodiversity, climate, and then how to implement the adaptation strategies that are, that are needed. So my three key takeaways are as follows. Firstly, science and innovation can be used to de-risk blended finance structures. And for that, we need technical assistance. And we actually need that at a far earlier stage, at a pre-investment uh, stage. Um, this is really needed to prioritize deal flow, to help investors and investors understand the risks, and then, and then implement those strategies that are needed in terms of adaptation. Secondly, uh, the key takeaway was that we need to support the local ecosystem. So really go local. And yeah, I mean, financial intermediaries, regional, local banks, because those are the ones that are lending to the small scale farmers. And those are the ones that have the trust with them. We need to develop the capacity internally uh, with these regional and local banks. And then the third one is, and I love this, um, one, of the, the, one of the colleagues mentioned this, that what, measured, what is measured gets done. And, and this is critical because the research and innovation ecosystem is really needs to support in terms of how do we measure natural capital? The, what about the ecosystem benefits? Um, how do we eventually move to true pricing as Ivo uh, alluded to? And, um, and then this is, needs to be standardized, understood. And, and that's really the, going to be the challenge going forward. Um, so yeah, so in conclusion, feeling very strongly that the innovative ecosystem is an important part of the process and it's actually converging much closer to 
the investment community. Um, and then the finance is one of those levers that really supports that process. Mm. So, Thank excellent. You. That's from our group. Thanks. Thank you very much, Richard. Thank you for making the bridge and your clear statements on, on, on takeaways. I'd like to give the word to Bettina Prato, Senior Coordinator, Smallholder and Agri SME Finance and Investment Network at IFAT. Bettina, over to you. Thank you so much for uh, getting the full name of Safin right, which is uh, sometimes a challenge for me too, even after four years. So um, in, our, in our breakout uh, group, we discussed a bit where do we need an ecosystem uh, around innovation? Where do we most need an innovation ecosystem? So we didn't take necessarily the notion of innovation ecosystem as a given, but mostly sort of address where do we need to mo uh, mostly need to, to build it. And we converged around uh, three or maybe four areas of, of focus for that. Uh, one is uh, building up uh, capacity at the institutional level to make sure that whatever um, investment uh, possibilities, investment opportunities are, are uh, identified or investments designed, they do indeed have uh, the kind of transformative impact that is needed, both in environmental terms and in terms of inclusion. We talked, for example, about the importance of um, taking forward landscape, integrated landscape planning. Uh, you know, I think this goes a little bit to the point that Richard was making about the importance of science. But we looked at the importance of, of, of building the institutional capacity to really mobilize participatory processes around that. We also spoke about the blending of actors, you know, and, and in that regard, um, the importance of innovation or, you know, the ecosystem, the ecosystem, the innovation ecosystem actors to work on bridging expectations, languages, you know, understandings. Uh, ways of working um, among different actors in the blended finance ecosystem, uh, a kind of work that many of you know is very, very costly and, and transaction heavy. We spoke about the, the role of these actors also in trying to demystify the market of financial product offerings and uh, you know, maybe help it to bring more transparency, to navigate the cluster uh, offerings in, uh, in the blended uh, um, finance market. And finally, we spoke about their importance of their role in pre and post investment capacity building, you know, at the, at the level of uh, uh, agri SMEs, uh, of companies, but also of smallholders. We spent quite a bit of time, Victoria, on understanding what the challenges may be. So that was a second question. And I'll very briefly um, make two points here. Uh, there was a sense well, that the, the capacity gaps are really significant uh, for market actor, actors, but also at the institutional level. And then that if we don't fix markets and particularly fix uh, unstructured, fragmented value chains, there's only so much that finance can, can achieve. There were other points raised, but you know these, these were the highlights. So back to you. Very good overview. Thank you very much, Bettina. Super. And I'm uh, going over to Hans Lott, Global Head of UN Environment Partnerships at Rabobank. Hans, counting on you to be brief and, and short as well and to the point. Over. Yeah, well, thank you, Victoria. I'll try to. We uh, started out on uh, the challenge, which is the sad fact that also Kitty van Heide alluded to, that uh, there's a huge hidden cost of the global food system. So how do we transition to a better reality, a, a better future state, if you will? We quickly centered around the farmer. Not so much that the farmer needs to do it all, but how do we enable the farmer? And we see on a business case level, lots of attractive investment opportunities. And I think the whole group agreed. So why is it not happening enough? So we wondered, we came with three reasons. The incentives for farmers need to be upped. The package of solutions to uh, farmers may be too difficult to adopt. And we may have to tailor blueprints for solutions uh, and that might require more work. So those are the main elements around to farmers, but we also had the benefit of a farmer within our group. And we had the perspective, don't look only at large or small farmers because they will have different needs. The smaller farmer may have an interest from an incentive perspective into interest and a lower interest specifically. 
a larger farmer keen to innovate may actually be more interested in a um, longer tenor, which is a totally different perspective. So that's something that banks need to take into account. So we really centered around entities who can enable the farmers. So that's homework for the banks. Uh, we also looked at the supply chain. So technology within the supply chain is to enable farmers. And there is a role for aggregators in the supply chain to make it more efficient, to enable the farmer to, to really uptake that technology, which is not easy, obviously. There was a point made as, as a second in that, that within the boardroom of an aggregator, a corporate, if you will, the, uh, blended finance needs to become more mainstream. Blended finance is too much within finance, corporate finance, treasury to be seen as a niche, and that should go away. Um, as a final note, we actually, and that's a little bit of a curveball because we were discussing blended finance, but the strong point was made, let's also look at unblended finance. There's 700 billion out there of government support into this industry. And let's look at repurpose, refocus that capital stream. So let's leave it at that, Victoria. I hope it was brief enough. Back to you. Brilliant. Thank you very much, Hans. Really on, 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 the, on the ball. And over to Peter Nell Boga, director at FMO. Peter Nell, what were your uh, main key takeaways from your group? Thank you very much. Indeed, we had the same question as Hans, a slightly different approach uh, in the sense that uh, we were th thinking about how do you define business cases? For instance, uh, are we not ignoring the earth as a, a stakeholder or as a value uh, in, and, and in that terms? Uh, also, how do you calculate return on investment? Are we indeed uh, including the benefits of an investment to the planet as a return? At the moment, we are not. So we're really, uh, the group was really calling for a system change in that respect. Um, also, uh, another takeaway was uh, that you need, uh, on the providing side, from the bank's perspective, really a commitment from the top level to implement such a strategy and to integrate blended finance, a bit like Hans was saying also. And on the other hand, on the receiving end, um, governments also play an important role. There are a few examples of governments who can create a good local uh, context or a, uh, in which entrepreneurs can actually uh, do their business. Uh, the third point um, is that uh, also we have to realize that there's also a strong economic drive especially with smallholders and poverty, uh, uh, poor regions, to damage the nature because out of lack of finance, because of a lack of, of resources and, and knowledge. So in that sense, uh, providing finance to those uh, rural areas would also help together with technical assistance. And lastly, uh, we definitely need the private sector. We didn't have any in the group, which was a bit missed, but they are the actors in the end. Uh, and we suggested that uh, 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 corporates should also have a, a well-defined purpose for the public benefit in their goal. Thank you very much, Peter Nell. I really love how, you, how you've described the earth as a stakeholder, uh, especially on today. Thank you. Thank you for your, your key takeaways. Over to Cor Vattel, researcher at Wageningen University. Cor, over to you. Thank you, Victoria. Uh, we had a very nice discussion about uh, the topic of how to scale impact. Um, so to go beyond how to scale investment opportunities, but really how to scale the impact of those investment opportunities. Uh, three takeaways, one about metrics, uh, a second one about implementation, and a third one about policy coherence. Uh, about metrics, uh, several participants uh, pointed at the fact that uh, it's a challenge to, to use common metrics to uh, measure progress, to measure bench against men benchmarks, to measure contributions of individual projects or organizations uh, to, uh, to common goals. Um, interesting solution. Uh, yeah, there is a KPI directory from UNEP FI, there is GIIN, etc. Uh, so on metrics, there is work being done, uh, but also the data collection part of the metrics uh, that is not organized in such a way that it is that it can be used at a higher level. Second point on implementation. 
implementation. Uh, implementation is a real challenge. Uh, so getting to uh, to real impact on the ground, uh, and several of the of the group uh, mentioned that it is uh, important to organize yourselves as multi stakeholders per sector per value chain, so that all batteries, all different actors, all batteries hammer to the same goal. Um, so organizing yourselves per sector, per value chain. And then of course, uh, I echo what some other people have said, how do you uh, address farmers outside structured value chains, the fragmented markets. Um, third point about policy coherence. Um, uh, if you want all batteries to hammer at the same at the same goal, you need common goals, common targets, uh, as simple as the net zero uh, type of, of target and translated then into sectors countries so that all actors in that sector uh, can contribute and can uh, work together to make sure that those targets are indeed met. Ministries of different kinds that not always work together and other uh, stakeholders, private and, and public. Thank you very much, Victoria. Over yeah, to you. Thank you. Thank you, Cor. Really great three key clear messages. And I just want to point out the rich discussion as well, which is going on in the chat uh, while we're listening to the feedback of each group. I'd like to hand it over to Dan Bensing, CEO of IDH. Dan, also to you, the question to summarize uh, the takeaways uh, in three minutes in three clear messages. Thank you, Dan. Great. Thank you, Victoria. And hello, everyone. We had a very lively debate, like in the other groups, um, embedded in a bit of frustration. Um, because the first takeaway is that money is not the issue. There's plenty of it. But indeed, as Cora said, it's not reaching uh, the ground, right? We, we don't achieve the, the impact. And one of the recommendations is that we really need to simplify things. Um, we discussed at length, for example, the cost of lawyers across blended finance deals. How can we simplify that? How can we create a platform that we can all use to drive down the cost so that it makes it easier to, um, to, to transact? So I think that's the, the first one. I think the second one uh, very much relates to the, the metrics point just being made. You know, how can we design basically a shared TA facility that will help to uh, design uh, for impact measure the impact and also be able to follow up after a deal is done on that impact so that we keep tracking, keep learning, keep moving, uh, keep moving uh, forwards. Um, and I think the third suggestion from the group is again related to the complexity is the, the challenge we have with aggregators, right? So the aggregators we spoke of are more, you know, uh, closer to the farmer. So whether that's a, um, an SME that provides services to the farmers or one of the supply chain companies. However, still, that makes it a rather complex and only few that want to deliver on that. So can we make a split between uh, the demand side of the supply chain and the farmer end and simplify the financial structure so that we can more easily reach the, uh, the farmers and, and, and have the transformation that we're all after? So these were very high level, the, uh, the recommendations. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dan. And thank you to everybody for uh, really stating it so clearly what, uh, what were the conclusions after. I'm sure very, very rich uh, and insightful discussions. Now to also uh, give us some kind of a summary and, and really clear takeaways, uh, we'll have a brief interview uh, and, and, um, and reflections back from Martin van Newkoop, Global Director for Agriculture and Food, Global Practices at the World Bank, uh, interviewed by Bruce Campbell, Director of CGIR CCAFs. And Bruce, uh, if you would just allow me one or two minutes at before the end of the hour so I can round it up, uh, the floor is yours to, to give us some final insights. Thank you. Okay, great. Thanks a lot. So it's nice to be able to speak to Martin, yeah? Good to uh, see Martin. you. <laughs> yeah. So Martin, I guess we're going to try and pull together some idea of how this can be taken forward. Um, so the UN Food System Summit has got has recognized four levers of change, and one of them is finance. So there's a there's a real way of getting some of this stuff into the Food System Summit. And I understand that the World Bank and yourself and IFPRI are the co-leads on this lever of change. So 
perhaps uh, uh, I know it's super challenging, but uh, it, having listened to all this and trying to summarize it in, 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 in such a short time, but what is your key takeaway from today's discussion that you, you could actually bring to the finance lever for the Food Systems Summit? Well, thanks very much, uh, Bruce. And indeed, uh, we are um, on request of Agnes Kalibata, the UN Special Envoy. I mean, the bank is one of the co-conveners of the finance lever together with IFPRI and also with the Food and Land Use uh, Coalition. Uh, you know, um, what I will take, you know, I mean, from this very rich uh, discussion, uh, a couple of points, um, you know, um, the resources are there. Money is not the issue, as I said. Uh, the returns are there. Uh, the energy and the examples um, are there. I mean, the One Acre Fund uh, was mentioned. And um, I, I sense a lot of enthusiasm and interest of, of many of the different stakeholders, I mean, to be part of this very challenging agenda because, I mean, food system transformation is not an easy agenda. Um, so I will bring that. But then in terms of substance, I mean, listening to the excellent uh, uh, reporters, I mean, reporting back, I mean, a couple of points, uh, I think, one is the centrality of incentives. Um, and part of that is not just the carrots, but also the sticks. I think Francesco uh, mentioned that. A second point is the importance of science, innovation, and technical assistance. I mean, all particularly related to the metrics. I mean, to make things simpler, as Dan was saying. I mean, getting in place MRV protocols, actually, that allow for uh, measuring um, uh, the type of impact I mean, that investments are kind of focusing on. I think the third point um, uh, is uh, making sure that solutions work for farmers. I mean, so any solution we come up with, we should be able to explain it to a farmer and be able to explain actually that it is good for his or her wallet. Um, and the, um, uh, the fourth point is um, a point by Adriana. I mean, that you cannot do it alone. So we have to be partners in the value chains. And uh, I think another uh, reporter was mentioning the importance of kind of scaling up offtake agreements. And I think they could play a very important role as a mechanism, I mean, to resolve multiple constraints in simultaneous fashion, because farmers do not face one constraint, they face multiple constraints. Um, I think a fifth point is the central role of government. I mean, Agriculture and food is a private sector activity, but clearly a very important role for the governments to play. And sixth, um, I mean, uh, Peter Nell saying, I mean, um, earth as a stakeholder when the private sector takes investment decisions and what can be done actually to make that happen. So those are kind of six takeaways. And there are many more, uh, but that actually st uh, struck me very much, uh, uh, Bruce. Yeah. And, uh, and I've also sensed quite a high interest from, from the stakeholders today, in the, from the financial sector stakeholders, in actually getting involved in this agenda. Is there, is there a way that they can uh, engage more effectively in the work of the lever for the Food System Summit? Yeah, definitely. So, so uh, one of the things that um, we've also done is, uh, you know, and also the Rabobank actually is playing a very important role here, um, is to set up a finance network for food systems under the umbrella of the World Business Council for Sustainable Development. Uh, and that actually, the idea is actually, have a, and it's already started, and have a broad range of financial sector institutions, I mean, uh, big global as well as the more local, including also state and public banks. I mean, uh, so, so, so financial players, I mean, can be active, become active in this finance network for, um, for food systems. Uh, also, um, you know, what we've been looking for is, you know, blended finance at scale. Um, so what could be possible entry points there? I, I would be looking forward, I mean, for, you know, the finance sector and, 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 and agribusiness more general to come up with, you know, concrete ideas. I mean, for instance, um, you know, food loss and waste. I mean, the third largest emitter of, um, of greenhouse gas emissions. Um, to reduce, to reduce greenhouse gas emissions, we need better investments in agro-logistics. Agro uh, um, uh, to what extent, I mean, do, do investments in agro-logistics reduce food loss and waste, thereby reducing greenhouse gas emissions, so that we can actually have a public goods element identified in those type of investments that could open the door for de-risking, I mean, uh, investment by the private sector in agro-logistics. So 
I like to see kind of you know examples or ideas coming forward. I mean, for the I mean for the private from the private sector. Uh, a second is of course rice. I mean, also a very big emitter. I mean, so can we think about better rice for producers and the planet? I mean, to kind of uh, what would it take to kind of half? I mean, greenhouse gas emissions. I mean, from the rice uh, sector. I mean, this is about 170 million hectares. Um, uh, what, you know, based on those middle models. I mean, what kind of finance solutions could we uh, provide? A third example, of course, is livestock sector. I mean, pastures take about two thirds. I mean, of all agricultural land in in, in the world. Um, uh, there are huge opportunities for agro silver pastoral systems. I mean, and the bank has some experience in that as well. Um, uh, that actually have proven, I mean, to be able to generate, I mean, the triple win solutions. Uh, what would it take, I mean, to convert, I mean, 10 million hectares, 100 million hectares of pastures under those kind of systems? I mean, we know from a project that we did in Colombia, it takes about 2000 to $2,500 a hectare. So, you know, Colombia has 30 million hectares of, of conventional pastures. Imagine we would convert 10 million hectares, one third only, at about 2000 to $2,500 per hectare. You're talking about an investment of $25 billion. I mean, this is scale. I mean, can we think of a kind of a, a way, a blended finance to de-risk those type of investments? Uh, so those opportunities are out there. And I like to hear, I think we in the finance league would like to hear um, suggestions on how we could structure those type of deals. And finally, I mean, what the private sector can do uh, I think you know, that was kind of embedded in what Peter Nell said earlier, Earth as a stakeholder. I mean, what can the private sector do to get their own house in, in, in order now? I mean, why not actually apply a $40 uh, shadow price of carbon in investment uh, decisions? I mean, why not benchmark certain ESG kind of indicators so that actually, I mean, environmental stewardship and aiming for nutritional outcomes becomes part of the core business of the private sector rather than being part of the C CSR. And, uh, you know, Victoria is part of the World Benchmarking Alliance. I think, I mean, they will have very important inputs for the private sector to move that angle there as well. So various dimensions, I think, uh, Bruce, where the private sector can be very active. Uh, that's great, Martin. Thanks a lot. Uh, I mean, this whole focusing on scaling is really crucial. And I think Viva started the day talking about the trickle, let's move it to a stream, let's move it to a river. You've mentioned the fact and others have mentioned that funds are there. It's, it's the way we get it all done. So I just wanted to thank the presenters and facilitators today. I wanted to thank the co-organizers, co Rubber Bank, CCAFs, UNEP, and the Ministry of Foreign Affairs of the Netherlands. Thanks to all the participants. Uh, had lots of uh, interesting discussions in the breakout groups. And a perhaps most important thank to Victoria for a really inspiring facilitation. Thanks a lot, for, uh, Victoria. And I hand it back to you, Victoria. Well, that was very unexpected. Thank you very much, Bruce. You you you, you took away some of my thunder. Absolutely. No, uh, big thank you to you, Bruce and Martin, for, these, for this excellent summary and for really capturing our thoughts how how to move forward and and i think exactly facilitators participants all generated such a rich discussion and and the final thought that i would just like to give to you is um to think of one jane goodall says that she says that you cannot get through a single day without having an impact on the world around you but i hope that the feeling that you take away from today is that you've positively impacted to today's discussion but I would also like to urge you, not just today, but especially today, to step away from your screen and set foot on our earth. Feel how all life on earth is connected and bring that connectedness to your daily work. I wish you again a very happy Earth Day and I look forward to seeing you in this UN Food Systems Summit adventure. All the best to you. Thank you.